Welcome and thank you for stopping by Sheila's Audiobooks and I am Sheila. This recording is coming from South Texas. All story recordings are in the public domain for United States copyright law. This story was first published January 1, 1955. Tal Howard has returned home from a Korean prisoner of war camp. He can't help feeling that something's missing. Desperate for a thrill as much as a big payday, Tal heads for the sleepy village in upstate New York where, a dying pal once assured him, buried treasure awaits. If Tal can find the girl who can lead him to it, another stranger is in town, Earl Fitzmartin, a cold, mysterious loner who terrorized him and the other POWs. Now this psychopath is watching Tal's every move, and waiting to strike. A Bullet for Cinderella Part 3 I didn't want Timmy to come out to the house. I was ashamed of where I lived. I never wanted any of the kids to see how and where I lived. My God, we lived like animals. It wasn't so bad until my mother died but from then on it was pretty bad. You saw the place? I saw it. The old man kept pretty well soaked in his vino. My brother was completely no good. My sister slept with anybody who took the trouble to ask her. We lived in filth. We were on the county relief rolls. The do-gooders brought us food and clothing at Thanksgiving and Christmas. I was proud as hell inside. I couldn't see any way out. The best I could do was try to keep myself clean as a button and not let any of the kids come out there. She came over and took one of my cigarettes, bent over for me to light it. Timmy came out there. It nearly killed me. Then I saw that it was alright. He didn't pay any attention to the way things were. I mean it didn't seem to mean much to him. That's the way they were, so that's the way they were. He was my friend. After that I was able to talk to him. He understood. He had his dreams, too. We talked over our dreams. When school was out that summer he came out a lot. He used to cut lawns and make money and we'd go to the movies. We used to swim in the river. He'd come out on his bike. He got hold of a broken down boy's spike for me. He fixed it up and I painted it. Then we could get around better. The relief people gave the old man a hard ride for buying me a bike. I had to explain how I got it and prove I didn't steal it. I can still remember the sneaky eyes on that cop. When it happened to us it was sudden. It was in late August. I'd gotten a job in the dime store by lying about my age and filling out the forms wrong. I was squirreling the money away. I spent Sundays with Timmy. His brother and his father didn't like him to see me, but he managed it. He had a basket on the front of his bike and we went off on a Sunday picnic. We went a long way into the country. Fifteen miles, I guess. We walked the bikes up a trail. We found a place under trees where it was like a park. It was far away from anybody. We could have been alone in the world. Maybe we were. We ate and then we stretched out and talked about how high school would be when it started in September. It was hot. We were in the shade. He went to sleep. I watched him while he was sleeping, the way his eyelashes were, and the way he looked like a little kid when he slept. I felt a big warmth inside me. It was a new way to feel toward him. When I couldn't stand it any longer, I slipped my arm under his neck and half lay across him and kissed him. He woke up with me kissing him. He was funny and kind of half scared and sort of half eager at the same time. I'd had a pretty liberal education as you can well imagine. I guess it was pretty sad. Two kids being as awkward and fumbling as you can possibly imagine, they're on that hill in the shade. But awkward as we were, it happened. We hardly talked at all on the way back. I knew enough to be damn scared. But fortunately nothing happened. From then on we were different with each other. It got to be something we did whenever we had a chance. It got better and better for us. But we weren't friends the way we were before. Sometimes we seemed almost to be enemies. We tried to hurt each other. It was a strong hunger. We found good places to go. It lasted for a year and a half. We never talked about marriage or things like that. We lived for now. There was one place we would go. We'd take one of the boats and... She stopped abruptly. We looked into each other's eyes. Now you know where he meant? I asked her softly. I think I do. Where? 
I don't think we can handle it that way, do you? How do you mean? I think we better go there together, don't you? There's nothing to keep you from going there by yourself, Antoinette. I know that. What would it mean if I told you I won't? In spite of the money hunger? I would be honest with a thing like this. I would. Believe me. I'd have known nothing about it. How much is there? I waited several moments, measuring her and the situation. I couldn't get to it without her. Nearly sixty thousand, he said. She sat down abruptly, saying a soundless oh. How, how would Timmy get hold of money like that? He did all the book work for the four companies he and his brother owned. He took over two years milking that much in cash out of the four companies. Why would he do that to George? It doesn't sound like Timmy. He planned to run off with Eloise. That thing George married? That pig. I knew her. Where is she? She went off with another man two years ago. Maybe she took the money with her. Timmy said she didn't know where he buried it. And she'd hardly be able to find it. I can guarantee that. So, this is George's money then, isn't it? I waited a moment. Yes, it is. But it was already stolen. That's right. And nobody knows about it. George doesn't suspect. Nobody knows about it but you and me, Tal. There's another one who knows about it. A man named Earl Fitzmartin. He was in the camp, too. He didn't know about the name Cindy. Now he does. He's smart. He may be able to trace the name to you. What's he like? He's smart and he's vicious. So are a lot of my friends. I don't think they're like Fitz. I don't think you could go with Fitz and find it and come back from wherever you went to find it, that is if it was a quiet place and he could put you where he dug up the money. Like that? I think so. I think there's something wrong in his head. I don't think he's very much like other people. Can you and I, can we trust each other, Tal? I think we can. We shook hands with formal ceremony. She looked at me quizzically. How about you, Tal? Why are you after the money? Like they say about climbing mountains. Because it's there. What will it mean to you? I don't know. I have to find it first. And then all of a sudden it's going to be some kind of an answer to everything? Maybe. What fouled you up, Tal? What broke your wagon? I don't know. I can place most people. I can't quite place you. You look like one type. You know. Played ball in school. Sells bonds or something. Working up to a ranch type house, a Brooks wardrobe, and someday winter vacations in Bermuda after the kids are in college. You look like that all except the eyes. And the eyes don't look like that at all. What do they look like? The eyes on the horse that knows they're going to shoot him because he was clumsy and busted his leg. When do we go after the money? She stepped to the kitchen door and looked at the clock. You'd feel better if we stayed together until we get it, wouldn't you? I guess I would. But it isn't essential. Your faith is touching. Didn't the police give you the word? They said something about a cute variation of the badger game. It was very cute. They couldn't convict. And it was very dishonest, Tal. But it wasn't a case of fleecing the innocent. It was pulled on some citizens who were trying to make a dishonest buck. Like this. I tell them my boyfriend is on one of the wheels at the Aztec. I tell the sucker the wheel is gimmicked. My boyfriend is sore at the house. The sucker has to have two or three thousand he wants trebled. I say I can't go in with him. I give him a password to tell the boyfriend. So they let him win six or seven thousand. He comes here with the money. The boyfriend is to show up later. But when the boyfriend shows up he is with a very evil looking citizen who holds a gun on him. Gun has silencer. Evil type shoots boyfriend. With a blank. Boyfriend groans and dies. Evil type turns gun on sucker. Takes the house money back, plus his two or three, and one time twelve, thousand. Sucker begs for his life. Reluctantly granted. Told to leave town fast. He does. He doesn't want to be mixed up in any murder. House money goes back to house. I get a cut of the take. I love acting. You should see me tremble and faint. Suppose he doesn't come back here with the money? They always have. They like to win the money and the girl too. They think it's like the movies. Now will you trust me out of your sight? I'll have to, won't I? I guess that's it. You'll have to. She smiled lazily. I have some errands. You can wait here. 
I'm going places where you can't go. You can wait here or you can meet me here. It's going to take three or four hours. By then it's going to be too late to get to the money today. We can go after it tomorrow morning. How are we going to divide it up? Shouldn't we count it first? But after we count it? She came toward me and put her hands on my shoulders. Maybe we won't divide it up, Tal. Maybe we won't squirrel it away. It's free money. Maybe we'll just put it in the pot and spend it as we need it until it's all gone. Maybe we'll see how far we can distribute it. We could spread it from Acapulco to Paris. Then maybe we won't be restless anymore. It would buy some drinks to Timmy. In some nice places. I felt uneasy. I said, I'm not that attractive to you. I know you're not. I like meaner looking men. She took her hands away. Maybe to you I'm like they used to say in the old fashioned books. Damaged goods. Not visibly. She shook her head. You kill me. It was just an idea. You seem nice and quiet. Not demanding. Let's say restful. You said you don't know what you'll do with the money. I said maybe I'll know when I get it. And if you don't? Then we'll talk some more. You'll wait here? I'll meet you here. At 5.30. She said she had to change. I left. I wondered if I was being a fool. I had lunch. I didn't have much appetite. I went to a movie. I couldn't follow the movie. I was worrying too much. I began to be convinced I had been a fool. She wasn't the sort of woman to trust. I wondered by what magic she had hypnotized me into trusting her. I could imagine her digging up the money. Once she had it there was nothing I could do. I wondered if my trust had been based on some inner unwillingness to actually take the money. Maybe subconsciously I wanted the moral problem off my hands. She wasn't back at 5.30. I waited in the lobby. I was sweating. She came in at quarter to six. She looked pale and upset. We rode up in the elevator together. She gave me the key to open her door. Her fingers were cold. She kept biting her lip. Once we were inside she began to pace. What's the matter? Shut up and let me think. Go make some drinks. That thing there is a bar. Scotch on the rocks for me. I made the drinks. After hers was gone she seemed a little quieter, more thoughtful. Sorry for being bitchy, Tal. I'm upset. My errands didn't work out the way I expected. Some people seem to have the idea that just because I was in on the festivities, I belong to the house. You don't need details. I have some funds around here and there. I got to the bank in time. That was fine. But it wasn't so good on the funds that are in, shall we say, safekeeping. I got some of them. Not all that's coming to me. Not by a hell of a lot. I'm not supposed to be able to take off. I made the mistake of saying I was thinking about it. They gave me some strong arguments. I made like changing my mind. Still I was tailed back. How do you like that? The hell with them. They might even be thinking of a hijack job. Now I know I've got to get out of here. I think I've got it worked out. Will you help? I guess so. I'm leaving for good. I can't make it tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow I can pick up a little more of what's due me. You drive over here Thursday morning. There's a back way out of here, through the cellar. I can grease the superintendent. Park on the parallel street back of here. Be there at ten sharp, ten in the morning. I'll come out the back way and away we'll go. But, damn it, I hate to leave so much stuff behind. A whole wardrobe. Is it dangerous? I don't know how rough they might get. I just don't like the sound of it. I don't like being patted on the shoulder and being given a big toothy grin and being told there, there, little Tony, you don't want to leave town. We all love you too much. I said, I could stay until after dark and you could pack things and I could take them out maybe. A couple of suitcases. You sure you want to? I'm willing to. If somebody followed you, they don't know I'm here now. You could leave before I do. They'd follow you. Then I can take the stuff out of my car. That should work all right. Gosh, it would really help. I've put a lot of money in clothes. I think it would be better than trying to get the stuff out in the morning, even with your help. I want it to move fast and smoothly. Stay away from the windows. She spent a lot of time packing. It was dark when she finished. She filled two big suitcases. They bulged and they were heavy. Leave them wherever you're staying when you come back for me. It's a motel. Get me a room, too. Please. 
She seemed to relax then. I think it's going to work out, Tal. They sort of, scared me. I know a lot. I don't plan to do any talking. That's what worries them, I think. You don't know how much I appreciate this. I'll, make it up to you. She wanted to be kissed and I kissed her. There was an eagerness and warmth and sensuality about her that made it a shock to touch her and hold her. We rocked off balance as we kissed, caught ourselves, smiled a little sheepishly. For now, she said. I took the suitcases into the hall. She went on down. I waited there for fifteen minutes and then I went down. The clerk was very dubious about my leaving with suitcases. He seemed about to speak, but didn't quite know what to say. I was gone before he had phrased the objection. I put the suitcases in the back seat and drove to Hilston. I ate at a drive-in on the edge of town. I took the suitcases back to my motel room. They were an alien presence there, almost as vivid as if she were there with me. I stowed them in the closet. Chapter 9 Wednesday was a grey day. I had hidden Grassman's body on Monday. It seemed longer ago than Monday. The memory was very vivid, but it seemed to be something that had happened a long time ago. I saw the suitcases when I opened my closet to get at my own clothes. I was curious about what she had packed. I felt guilty about opening them. Then I decided that I had earned the right to look. I put the larger one on the bed and tried the latches. It wasn't locked. It popped open. There were furs on top, silky and lustrous. She had packed neatly. Underneath the furs were suits, dresses, skirts, blouses. The bottom layer was underclothing, slips, panties with frothy lace and intricate embroidery in shades from purest white through all of the spectrum to black. The other suitcase was much the same. The clothing was fresh and fragrant with perfume. It was perfume that was not musky. It had a clean flower scent. I could understand how this was important to her. I remembered her speaking of the charity gifts of clothing, of the dirt in which she had grown up. She would want clothing, a great deal of it, and all fresh and clean. I found the black leather box in the bottom of the second suitcase. I opened it. Jewelry lay against a black velvet partition. Bracelets, rings, clips. I could not tell if the white and green and red stones were real. They were lustrous. They caught fire in the light. But I could not tell. I lifted the partition. There was money under it. Money in fifties and twenties and hundreds, a sizable stack of bills. I counted it. There was six thousand and forty dollars. When I replaced the partition the stones looked more real. After the suitcases were back in the closet, I wondered what her thinking had been when she had packed the money in there. Perhaps she assumed I wouldn't search the bags. I hadn't intended to. Maybe she thought that even if I did search them and did find the money it would be safer with me than it would in the apartment. She could have been right. It was safe with me. Even had I been the sort of person to take it and leave, that sort of person would have waited for the chance of acquiring much more, a chance only Antoinette could provide. I found the bird woman cleaning one of the rooms. I paid her another two nights in advance for myself and asked her to save the room next to mine for a friend who would check in on Thursday. I gave her one night rental on the second room. As I drove toward town I found myself wondering if what Antoinette had proposed might be the best solution for me. It was tempting. I thought of the rightness of her, the pungency of her personality, the very startling impact of her lips. There would be no illusions between us. She would make it easy to forget a lot of things. We would have no claims on each other, and would be wedded only by the money, and divorced when it was gone. After I ate I went to the hardware store. I parked a half block from it. I wanted to talk to George again. I wanted to see if I could steer the conversation toward Eloise and Mr. Fulton. I wanted to see if he would say anything that would make more sense out of the Grassman death. Obviously Fitz hadn't contacted Antoinette. And she seemed confident that no one else could find the money. So it began to appear less logical that Grassman's death had anything to do with the 60,000. Then why had Grassman been killed? He could have gotten into some kind of argument with Fitz. We had seen Grassman at the lake on Saturday. Somehow I had spoiled things with Ruth and so I had gotten drunk on Saturday and again on Sunday. Fitz could have killed him on Sunday, not meaning to do so. He could have loaded the body in his car and gone looking for some place to put it, and spotted my car. The California plates would be easy to spot. But by putting the body in my car, he would be eliminating any chance of my leading him to the money Timmy had buried. But maybe Fitz was convinced that with the clue in his possession, with the name Cindy, 
He could accomplish as much or more than I could. He was a man of great confidence in himself. And not, I had begun to believe, entirely sane. If Grassman had contacted Fitz, perhaps George could provide me with some meaningful clue as to why. But there was a sign on the door. The store was closed. The sign gave no additional information. It was crudely printed on paper scotch taped to the inside of the door, closed. I cupped my hands on the glass and looked inside. The stock did not seem to be disturbed. It could not mean closed for good. It took me several minutes to remember where George lived. I couldn't remember who had told me. White's Hotel. I found it three blocks away. It was a frame building. It was seedy looking, depressing. It had once been painted yellow and white. I went into the lobby. Old men sat in scuffed leather chairs and smoked and read the papers. Two pimpled boys stood by the desk making intense work out of selecting the right holes to punch on a punch board while the desk man watched them, his eyes bored, his heavy face slack, smoke curling up from the cigarette between his lips. I want to see George Warden. Second floor. The stairs are over there. A girl just went on up to see him a minute ago. I hesitated and he said go ahead on up. Room 203. She takes care of him when he gets in rough shape. It's okay. George got taken drunk the last couple of days. She tried to phone him and he wouldn't answer the room phone so she came on down. Just now got here. I guessed it was Ruth. I wanted to see her. I didn't know how she'd react to me. I didn't want to talk to George with her there, though. I went up the stairs slowly. When my eyes were above the level of the second floor, I saw Ruth running down the gloomy hall toward me. I reached the top of the stairs just as she got there. Her eyes were wide and unfocused. Her mouth was working. Her face was like wet paper. I called her name and she focused on me, hesitated, and then came into my arms. She was trembling all over. She ground her forehead against my chin, rocking her head from side to side, making an odd chattering, moaning sound. After a few moments she regained enough control to speak. It's George. In the room. On the bed. Wait right here. N, no. I've got to telephone. Police. Her high heels chattered down the wooden stairs. I went back to room 203. The door was open. George lay across the bed, naked. There was a rifle on the floor. A towel was loosely wrapped around the muzzle. It was scorched where the slug had gone through it. I moved uneasily around to where I could see his head. The back of his head was blown off. I knew that before I saw his head because I had seen the smeared wall. In the instant of death all body functions had shared the smeared explosion. The room stank. His body had a grey, withered look. I moved backward to the door. I backed through it into the hall. I mopped my forehead. It was a hell of a thing for Ruth to have walked in on. They could just as well move the sign to this door, to this life. Closed. Closed for good. I stood there in the hall and heard the sirens. The desk clerk came lumbering down the hall. Old men from the lobby followed him. They crowded by me and filled the doorway and stared in. Good Christ! The desk clerk said. My oh my oh my, said one of the old men. Some of the faces were familiar. I knew Hillis and I knew Brubaker and I knew Prine. Prine was not on top this time. He was taking orders from a Captain Marion. Captain Marion was a mild, sandy man who wanted everything cozy and neighborly. He had a wide face full of smile wrinkles, and a soft, buzzing voice, and little blue eyes sunk back beyond the thick crisp blonde curl of his eyebrows. Rather than individual questioning, he made it a seminar. I could tell from Prine's bleak look that he did not approve at all. They got us all down into a room in police headquarters. There was a stenotype operator present. Captain Marion apologized for inconveniencing anybody. He apologized several times. He shifted papers and cleared his throat and coughed. Well now, as I finish with you people I'll tell you whether you can take off or not. Nothing particularly official about this. It's a sort of investigation. Get the facts in front of us. Let's see what we got here. First let me say a couple of words about George. I knew his daddy well and I knew George well, and I knew Timmy. George could have been a big man in this town. He was on his way in that direction, but he lost his grip. Lots of men never seem to get back on the ball after bad wife trouble. But I had hopes George would pull out of it. Seems to me like he didn't. And that's too bad. It's quite a waste. George was a bright man. 
I say or prine shift his weight restlessly. I got it right here on this paper that the body was discovered at twenty minutes after ten this morning by Ruth Stan. Now Ruthie, what in the wide world were you doing down there at that White's Hotel? Hen, I mean Captain Marion, George didn't have anybody to look after him. Every once in a while I'd sort of, help him get straightened out. You used to go with Timmy, didn't you? Yes, I did. I was trying to help George. Did Buck approve of that? I don't think so. I mean I know he didn't. I see. Ruthie, what took you down there this morning? I went by the store yesterday afternoon and there was a closed sign on it. It worried me. After I got home I phoned White's Hotel. Herman Watkins was on the desk. He told me George was drinking. This morning I phoned the store and there was no answer. Then I tried the hotel. George wouldn't answer the room phone. He does that sometimes. I mean he used to do that. I have a key. So I drove down and went up to the room. The door wasn't even locked. I opened it and, I saw him. What were you planning to do? Get him some coffee. Get him cleaned up. Give him a good talking to, I guess. As I've done before. Ruthie, you can stay or go, just as you please. Now then, I've got this other name here. Talbot Howard. You came along right after Ruthie. What were you doing there? I saw Ruth Stam start to get up and then sit back down. I wanted to talk to George. I saw that the store was closed, so I went to the hotel. What did you want to talk about? Prine answered for me. We had this man in last week, Captain. We thought he was another one of those people Rose Fulton keeps sending down here. This man claims he's writing a book about men who died in the prison camp where Timmy Warden died. This man claims he was there, too. He's never written a book. He's unemployed, has no permanent address, and has a record of one conviction. For what? I answered for myself. For taking part in a student riot when I was in school. Disturbing the peace and resisting an officer. The officer broke my collarbone with a nightstick. That was called resisting an officer. Captain Marion looked at Prine. Steve, you make everything sound so damn serious. Maybe this boy wants to write a book. Maybe he's trying. I happen to doubt it, Captain, Prine said. What did you want to talk to George about, son? I wanted more information about Timmy. I glanced at Ruth. She was looking at me with contempt. She looked away. What happened when you got there? The desk clerk told me a girl had just gone up. I met Miss Stam when I got to the head of the stairs. She was too upset to talk. I got a look in that room myself. Hardly blame her. Terrible looking sight. All right, son. You can go if you want to. I'd prefer him to stay, if you don't mind, Captain. Marion sighed. All right, Steve. Stick around, Mr. Howard. Now, Herman, we'll get to you. The doc says he can fix the time of death about midnight last night. He may be able to get it a little closer but he says that's a pretty good guess. Did you see George come in? No, sir. I didn't see him. It was a pretty noisy night last night. There were a lot of people coming and going. I heard George was doing his drinking at Stump's, until Stump wouldn't serve him any more. He left there about ten. Frankly, Captain, I was playing a little poker in the room behind where the desk is. I can't see the desk from there. But I can hear the bell on the desk and hear the switchboard if any calls come in. That's why I brought Mr. Caswell along with me. I'm Caswell, a little old man said. He had a thin, high voice and an excited manner. Bartholomew Boris Caswell, retired eleven years ago. I was a conductor on the Erie and Western Railroad. I'm not what you call a drinking man and I see George Warden come in. I was behind him, maybe half a block. I just happened to look at my watch because I wondered what time I was getting in. Watch said 11.27. Doesn't lose a minute a month. See it? One of the best ever made. Right now it's 11 minutes of two and that clock on the wall over your head, Captain, is running two minutes slow. Are you sure it was George? Sure as I know my own name. Man alive, he was drunk. Wagging his arms, staggering all over. If it wasn't for his friend he'd never have made it home. Who was his friend? Don't know him and didn't get a look at him. Stiff-legged man, though. Stiff in one leg. Like a limp. He horsepowered George right into the hotel. Time I came in, they were gone upstairs. The lobby was empty. 
I could hear some of the boys hooting and hollering and carrying on up on the second floor. So I went there. They were back in Lester's room. He had himself two gallons of red wine. At least he started with two gallons. I had myself a little out of my own glass that I got from my room. It didn't set so good on what I had been drinking. Didn't set good at all. It liked to come up on me. So I went on down to bed. Got into my room at three after midnight. Right then I heard a funny noise. Just when I was closing my door, it sounded a little like somebody dropped a book or maybe tipped over in a chair and thumped his head. I listened and I didn't hear anything else so I went right to bed. It turns out that must have been when George shot himself. That would fit what the doctor says. Herman, could you find anybody else who heard anything? I couldn't find anybody else at all. You don't need anybody else, Caswell said. I've told you all you've got to know, haven't I? Thanks, Mr. Caswell. You can go along if you want to. I'll stay and see what happens, thank you. Captain Marion studied the papers in front of him and then muttered to himself for a while. At last he looked up. It's not up to me to make any decision. That'll be up to the inquest. But I think we can figure that George was pretty beat down. Lost his wife. Lost his brother. Lost most of his business. Drinking heavy. It certainly looks to me that if any man had reasons for suicide, George did. Steve, you look uneasy. What's on your mind? Captain, I don't think it's that easy. I've seen some suicides. I've read up on them. A towel was used as a crude silencer. I've never heard of that being used. A suicide doesn't care about the noise. He wants people to come running. He wants it to be dramatic. The towel-wrapped muzzle of the gun was in his mouth when it went off. The gun was new. A 303 bolt bolt-action rifle, right out of stock, with the tag still wired to the trigger guard. There were nice clean prints on the side of the action. Too clean. They were George's, of course. There were no prints on the inside doorknob. It wasn't wiped, but it had been smeared. That could have been accidental or purposeful. Many suicides are naked. More than half. That fits. Buttons had been ripped off his shirt. Maybe he was in a hurry. Maybe somebody undressed him in a hurry. There was a bottle on the floor, under the bed. Half full of liquor. George left very clear prints on that. I'm interested in the stiff-legged man. What do you mean, Steve? I think somebody met George after he left Stump's. I talked to Stump. George was nearly helpless. He carried a key to the store. I think somebody went to the store with him and took a rifle out of stock. I think he slid it down his pant leg. That gave him a stiff-legged walk. He took George up to his room. He fed him more liquor. When he passed out he undressed him, sat him on the edge of the bed, wrapped the muzzle, opened his mouth, put it between his teeth, and pulled the trigger. He put prints on the gun and bottle, smeared the knob, and left. Steve, damn it, you always make things harder. Strange things are going on. I got a report from the county sheriff's office today. A man named Grassman left his stuff in a cabin and didn't come back for it. That was last Sunday. He'd been staying there a couple of weeks. Milton Grassman from Chicago. The county police found stuff in the cabin to indicate he worked for a Chicago firm of investigators, and was down here on that Fulton thing. He stayed 20 miles north of town, on the Reading Road. Yesterday a car was towed in. Overtime parking. A routine deal. Blue sedan, late model, Illinois plates. Just before I came here I found out the registration on the steering post is to this Grassman. All right now. Grassman has disappeared, leaving his clothes and his car. George Warden dies all of a sudden. Grassman was down here looking into the disappearance of a Mr. Fulton who took off with George Warden's wife. It ties up, somehow. I want to know how. If we can tie it up. We can find out for sure if it was suicide or murder. I vote for murder. It was a bold way to do it, and a dangerous way to do it. The man who did it took chances. But I think he did it. Was it Grassman? Was it that man over there who claims to be writing a book? Who was it? And why was it done? Marion sighed heavily. Steve, I could never get it through my head why you take off so ugly on those men who came down to poke around. That poor Fulton woman. If she wants to spend her money, why don't you let her? It's no skin off us. I don't want my judgment or the result of any investigation of mine questioned. We're the law and order here. I don't want amateur competition. Sometimes those fellas can help, Steve. 
I have yet to see the day. What did those Chicago people say? Did you get in touch? No. Well, you phone them, Steve. Or teletype Chicago and let them handle it with the agency. Those fellows may want to send somebody else down. Why, for God's sake? Demanded Prine, losing control. Why, to look for Grassman? Marion said mildly. Missing, isn't he? I managed to walk out beside Ruth. She was cool, almost to the point of complete indifference. Ruth, I want to be able to explain some time. I don't think it's worth bothering about, really. The day had begun to clear and we stood in frail sunlight. I don't know why I should worry so much about your good opinion, I said, trying to strike a light note. If I were you, I wouldn't even think about it. I'm usually frank with people. Too frank, as you will remember. I expect others to be the same. I usually expect too much. I'm usually disappointed. I'm getting used to it. I found myself becoming annoyed at her attitude. It would be nice for you to get used to it. It would make it easier to be the only perfect person, surrounded by all the rest of us. What do you think you? I think you sounded pretty stuffy. That's all. You make a lot of virtuous noise. And you condemn me without knowing the score. You don't seem exactly eager to tell me the score. We stood glaring at each other. It suddenly tickled her sense of the ridiculous. I saw her struggle to keep from smiling. Just then a man came up to us. He was young, with a thin face and heavy horn-rimmed glasses. Hello, Alan, Ruth said. Alan, this is Tal Howard, Alan Peary. We shook hands and he said, Ruthie, I just heard they're going to appoint me to straighten out George's estate. What there is left of it. Do you happen to know what happened to the household effects when he sold to Sila? He sold everything, Alan. Alan Peary shook his head. I don't know where the money went. I've been in touch with the bank. There's only three accounts open. The lumber yard and the store and his personal account. And damn little money in any of them. You're about the only one of his old friends who saw much of him, Ruth. Where did it all go? He liquidated an awful lot of stuff in the past year. What the hell was he doing? Playing the market? Gambling? Women? Drugs? He was drinking it up, I guess. Oh, sure, Alan said. I know what Sila paid for the house. I know what he got when he sold the lease on Delaware Street. I know what he got for the cement trucks. If he didn't touch anything but Napoleon brandy at 25 bucks a bottle, he'd have to drink a thousand bucks a week worth to go through that money. Maybe it's in some other account, Alan. I doubt it. He looked at me uneasily and said, I don't want to talk out of school, but he had a big tab at stumps. He was behind on the room at the hotel. And I heard last week that Sid Forrester had a 60-day exclusive listing on the lumber yard and had an interested customer lined up. That was the only thing George had left that was making any money. Maybe when you go over his accounts you can find what he wrote checks for, Alan. That isn't going to work, either. He wrote checks for cash and cashed them at the bank. Amounts ranging from 500 to 2,000. Ruth frowned. He didn't seem worried about money. I've tried to talk to him a few times. He didn't seem worried about anything. He didn't seem to give a damn about anything. He almost seemed to be enjoying some big joke, on himself. And right at that moment something became very clear to me. Something I should have seen before. I wondered why I had been so dense. Once you made the proper assumption, a lot of things fell into their proper place. Chapter 10 I realized they were still talking, but I was no longer listening to what they said. Then I realized that Ruth had spoken to me. I beg your pardon? I said I have to be running along. Wait a minute. Please. Can we talk for a minute? You too, Mr. Peary. I saw that she was holding her shoulders as if she were chilled. The sun had gone under again and a raw April wind was blowing. We could sit in my car a minute. I want to make a guess as to what George was doing with the money. They looked at me oddly. Peary shrugged and said, sure. We crossed the street and got into my car, Ruth in the middle. It's just a guess. You know that Rose Fulton has never been satisfied with her husband's disappearance. Prine investigated and he's satisfied. George was out of town when Eloise ran off with Fulton. A neighbor saw Eloise carry a bag out to the car. Now suppose that Eloise wasn't running away permanently. Imagine that she was just going to stay the night with Fulton. She didn't want to stay at the house in case George should come home. 
and there were the neighbors to consider. She wouldn't want to go to a motel or hotel in the area. She was too well known. So she planned to go up to the lake with Fulton. She took just the things she'd need for overnight. Was it the time of year when there wouldn't be people up at the lake? It was this time of year, Ruth said. Now suppose George came home and found she wasn't home. He started hunting for her. And went to the lake. Or imagine that for some reason, driving back from his trip out of town, he stopped at the lake and found them there together. What would he have done? I see where this is heading, Ruth said. It gives me a strange feeling. George loved Eloise and trusted her. I guess he was the only one who couldn't see what she was. If George walked in on the two of them, I think he would have gone temporarily insane. I think he would have killed them. He used to be a powerful man, Tal. So he killed them up there at the lake. He got rid of the bodies. He could have wired weights to the bodies and sunk them in the lake, but I'm more inclined to think he buried them. Maybe he buried them on his own land there. He was lucky in that she had been seen at the inn with Fulton and she was seen leaving with Fulton. He had no way to know it would work out so well. He killed them in anger, and buried the bodies in panic. For a long time he was safe. He tried to go on as though nothing had happened. He played the part of the abandoned husband. And then somebody found the bodies. They didn't report it to the police. They went to George. Perry said eagerly, and put the bite on him. They demanded money and kept demanding money. He had to start selling things. When nearly everything was gone, he killed himself. He couldn't face exposure and trial and conviction. So we have to look for somebody who has gotten rich all of a sudden. Or somebody smart enough to just put it away and not attract attention by spending it, I said. He seemed so strange sometimes, Ruth said softly. He said queer things I didn't understand. He was like, one of those bad movies where people laugh at the wrong places. When my eyes were above the level of the second floor, I saw Ruth running down the gloomy hall toward me. I reached the top of the stairs just as she got there. Her eyes were wide and unfocused. Her mouth was working. Her face was like wet paper. I called her name and she focused on me, hesitated, and then came into my arms. She was trembling all over. She ground her forehead against my chin, rocking her head from side to side, making an odd chattering, moaning sound. After a few moments she regained enough control to speak. It's George. In the room. On the bed. Wait right here. N, no. I've got to telephone. Police. Her high heels chattered down the wooden stairs. I went back to room 203. The door was open. George lay across the bed, naked. There was a rifle on the floor. A towel was loosely wrapped around the muzzle. It was scorched where the slug had gone through it. I moved uneasily around to where I could see his head. The back of his head was blown off. I knew that before I saw his head because I had seen the smeared wall. In the instant of death all body functions had shared the smeared explosion. The room stank. His body had a grey, with a look. I moved backward to the door. I backed through it into the hall. I mopped my forehead. It was a hell of a thing for Ruth to have walked in on. They could just as well move the sign to this door, to this life. Closed. Closed for good. I stood there in the hall and heard the sirens. The desk clerk came lumbering down the hall. Old men from the lobby followed him. They crowded by me and filled the doorway and stared in. Good Christ. The desk clerk said. My oh my oh my said one of the old men. Some of the faces were familiar. I knew Hillis and I knew Brubaker and I knew Prine. Prine was not on top this time. He was taking orders from a Captain Marion. Captain Marion was a mild, sandy man who wanted everything cozy and neighborly. He had a wide face full of smile wrinkles, and a soft, buzzing voice, and little blue eyes sunk back beyond the thick crisp blonde curl of his eyebrows. Rather than individual questioning, he made it a seminar. I could tell from Prine's bleak look that he did not approve at all. They got us all down into a room in police headquarters. There was a stenotype operator present. Captain Marion apologized for inconveniencing anybody. He apologized several times. He shifted papers and cleared his throat and coughed. Well now, as I finish with you people I'll tell you whether you can take off or not. Nothing particularly official about this. It's a sort of investigation. Get the facts in front of us. Let's see what we got here. First let me say a couple of words about George. I knew his daddy well and I knew George well, 
and I knew Timmy. George could have been a big man in this town. He was on his way in that direction, but he lost his grip. Lots of men never seem to get back on the ball after bad wife trouble. But I had hopes George would pull out of it. Seems to me like he didn't. And that's too bad. It's quite a waste. George was a bright man. I say or prine shift his weight restlessly. I got it right here on this paper that the body was discovered at twenty minutes after ten this morning by Ruth Stan. Now Ruthie, what in the wide world were you doing down there at that White's Hotel? Hen, I mean Captain Marion, George didn't have anybody to look after him. Every once in a while I'd sort of, help him get straightened out. You used to go with Timmy, didn't you? Yes, I did. I was trying to help George. Did Buck approve of that? I don't think so. I mean I know he didn't. I see. Ruthie, what took you down there this morning? I went by the store yesterday afternoon and there was a closed sign on it. It worried me. After I got home I phoned White's Hotel. Herman Watkins was on the desk. He told me George was drinking. This morning I phoned the store and there was no answer. Then I tried the hotel. George wouldn't answer the room phone. He does that sometimes. I mean he used to do that. I have a key. So I drove down and went up to the room. The door wasn't even locked. I opened it and, I saw him. What were you planning to do? Get him some coffee. Get him cleaned up. Give him a good talking to, I guess. As I've done before. Ruthie, you can stay or go, just as you please. Now then, I've got this other name here. Talbot Howard. You came along right after Ruthie. What were you doing there? I saw Ruth Stam start to get up and then sit back down. I wanted to talk to George. I saw that the store was closed, so I went to the hotel. What did you want to talk about? Prine answered for me. We had this man in last week, Captain. We thought he was another one of those people Rose Fulton keeps sending down here. This man claims he's writing a book about men who died in the prison camp where Timmy Warden died. This man claims he was there, too. He's never written a book. He's unemployed, has no permanent address, and has a record of one conviction. For what? I answered for myself. For taking part in a student riot when I was in school. Disturbing the peace and resisting an officer. The officer broke my collarbone with a nightstick. That was called resisting an officer. Captain Marion looked at Prine. Steve, you make everything sound so damn serious. Maybe this boy wants to write a book. Maybe he's trying. I happen to doubt it, Captain, Prine said. What did you want to talk to George about, son? I wanted more information about Timmy. I glanced at Ruth. She was looking at me with contempt. She looked away. What happened when you got there? The desk clerk told me a girl had just gone up. I met Miss Stam when I got to the head of the stairs. She was too upset to talk. I got a look in that room myself. Hardly blame her. Terrible looking sight. All right, son. You can go if you want to. I'd prefer him to stay, if you don't mind, Captain. Marion sighed. All right, Steve. Stick around, Mr. Howard. Now, Herman, we'll get to you. The doc says he can fix the time of death about midnight last night. He may be able to get it a little closer but he says that's a pretty good guess. Did you see George come in? No, sir. I didn't see him. It was a pretty noisy night last night. There were a lot of people coming and going. I heard George was doing his drinking at Stump's, until Stump wouldn't serve him any more. He left there about ten. Frankly, Captain, I was playing a little poker in the room behind where the desk is. I can't see the desk from there but I can hear the bell on the desk and hear the switchboard if any calls come in. That's why I brought Mr. Caswell along with me. I'm Caswell, a little old man said. He had a thin, high voice and an excited manner. Bartholomew Boris Caswell, retired eleven years ago. I was a conductor on the Erie and Western Railroad. I'm not what you call a drinking man and I see George Warden come in. I was behind him, maybe half a block. I just happened to look at my watch because I wondered what time I was getting in. Watch said 11.27. Doesn't lose a minute a month. See it? One of the best ever made. Right now it's 11 minutes of two and that clock on the wall over your head, Captain, is running two minutes slow. Are you sure it was George? Sure as I know my own name. Man alive, he was drunk. Wagging his arms, staggering all over. 
If it wasn't for his friend he'd never have made it home. Who was his friend? Don't know him and didn't get a look at him. Stiff-legged man, though. Stiff in one leg. Like a limp. He horsepowered George right into the hotel. Time I came in, they were gone upstairs. The lobby was empty. I could hear some of the boys hooting and hollering and carrying on up on the second floor. So I went there. They were back in Lester's room. He had himself two gallons of red wine. At least he started with two gallons. I had myself a little out of my own glass that I got from my room. It didn't set so good on what I had been drinking. Didn't set good at all. It liked to come up on me. So I went on down to bed. Got into my room at three after midnight. Right then I heard a funny noise. Just when I was closing my door, it sounded a little like somebody dropped a book or maybe tipped over in a chair and thumped his head. I listened and I didn't hear anything else so I went right to bed. It turns out that must have been when George shot himself. That would fit what the doctor says. Herman, could you find anybody else who heard anything? I couldn't find anybody else at all. You don't need anybody else, Caswell said. I've told you all you've got to know, haven't I? Thanks, Mr. Caswell. You can go along if you want to. I'll stay and see what happens, thank you. Captain Marion studied the papers in front of him and then muttered to himself for a while. At last he looked up. It's not up to me to make any decision. That'll be up to the inquest. But I think we can figure that George was pretty beat down. Lost his wife. Lost his brother. Lost most of his business. Drinking heavy. It certainly looks to me that if any man had reasons for suicide, George did. Steve, you look uneasy. What's on your mind? Captain, I don't think it's that easy. I've seen some suicides. I've read up on them. A towel was used as a crude silencer. I've never heard of that being used. A suicide doesn't care about the noise. He wants people to come running. He wants it to be dramatic. The towel-wrapped muzzle of the gun was in his mouth when it went off. The gun was new. A 303 bolt action rifle, right out of stock, with the tag still wired to the trigger guard. There were nice clean prints on the side of the action. Too clean. They were George's, of course. There were no prints on the inside doorknob. It wasn't wiped, but it had been smeared. That could have been accidental or purposeful. Many suicides are naked. More than half. That fits. Buttons had been ripped off his shirt. Maybe he was in a hurry. Maybe somebody undressed him in a hurry. There was a bottle on the floor, under the bed. Half full of liquor. George left very clear prints on that. I'm interested in the stiff-legged man. What do you mean, Steve? I think somebody met George after he left Stump's. I talked to Stump. George was nearly helpless. He carried a key to the store. I think somebody went to the store with him and took a rifle out of stock. I think he slid it down his pant leg. That gave him a stiff-legged walk. He took George up to his room. He fed him more liquor. When he passed out he undressed him, sat him on the edge of the bed, wrapped the muzzle, opened his mouth, put it between his teeth, and pulled the trigger. He put prints on the gun and bottle, smeared the knob, and left. Steve, damn it, you always make things harder. Strange things are going on. I got a report from the county sheriff's office today. A man named Grassman left his stuff in a cabin and didn't come back for it. That was last Sunday. He'd been staying there a couple of weeks. Milton Grassman from Chicago. The county police found stuff in the cabin to indicate he worked for a Chicago firm of investigators, and was down here on that Fulton thing. He stayed 20 miles north of town, on the Reading Road. Yesterday a car was towed in. Overtime parking. A routine deal. Blue sedan, late model. Illinois plates. Just before I came here I found out the registration on the steering post is to this Grassman. All right now. Grassman has disappeared, leaving his clothes and his car. George Warden dies all of a sudden. Grassman was down here looking into the disappearance of a Mr. Fulton who took off with George Warden's wife. It ties up, somehow. I want to know how. If we can tie it up, we can find out for sure if it was suicide or murder. I vote for murder. It was a bold way to do it, and a dangerous way to do it. The man who did it took chances. But I think he did it. Was it Grassman? Was it that man over there who claims to be writing a book? Who was it? And why was it done? Marion sighed heavily. Steve, I could never get it through my head why you take off so ugly on those men who came down to poke around. 
That poor Fulton woman, if she wants to spend her money, why don't you let her? It's no skin off us. I don't want my judgment or the result of any investigation of mine questioned. We're the law and order here. I don't want amateur competition. Sometimes those fellas can help, Steve. I have yet to see the day. What did those Chicago people say? Did you get in touch? No. Well, you phone them, Steve. Or teletype Chicago and let them handle it with the agency. Those fellows may want to send somebody else down. Why, for God's sake? Demanded Prine, losing control. Why, to look for Grassman? Marion said mildly. Missing, isn't he? I managed to walk out beside Ruth. She was cool, almost to the point of complete indifference. Ruth, I want to be able to explain some time. I don't think it's worth bothering about, really. The day had begun to clear and we stood in frail sunlight. I don't know why I should worry so much about your good opinion, I said, trying to strike a light note. If I were you, I wouldn't even think about it. I'm usually frank with people. Too frank, as you will remember. I expect others to be the same. I usually expect too much. I'm usually disappointed. I'm getting used to it. I found myself becoming annoyed at her attitude. It would be nice for you to get used to it. It would make it easier to be the only perfect person, surrounded by all the rest of us. What do you think you? I think you sounded pretty stuffy. That's all. You make a lot of virtuous noise and you condemn me without knowing the score. You don't seem exactly eager to tell me the score. We stood glaring at each other. It suddenly tickled her sense of the ridiculous. I saw her struggle to keep from smiling. Just then a man came up to us. He was young, with a thin face and heavy horn-rimmed glasses. Hello, Alan, Ruth said. Alan, this is Tal Howard, Alan Peary. We shook hands and he said, Ruthie, I just heard they're going to appoint me to straighten out George's estate. What there is left of it. Do you happen to know what happened to the household effects when he sold to Sila? He sold everything, Alan. Alan Peary shook his head. I don't know where the money went. I've been in touch with the bank. There's only three accounts open. The lumberyard and the store and his personal account. And damn little money in any of them. You're about the only one of his old friends who saw much of him, Ruth. Where did it all go? He liquidated an awful lot of stuff in the past year. What the hell was he doing? Playing the market? Gambling? Women? Drugs? He was drinking it up, I guess. Oh, sure, Alan said. I know what Sila paid for the house. I know what he got when he sold the lease on Delaware Street. I know what he got for the cement trucks. If he didn't touch anything but Napoleon brandy at 25 bucks a bottle, he'd have to drink a thousand bucks a week worth to go through that money. Maybe it's in some other account, Alan. I doubt it. He looked at me uneasily and said, I don't want to talk out of school, but he had a big tab at stumps. He was behind on the room at the hotel. And I heard last week that Sid Forrester had a 60-day exclusive listing on the lumber yard and had an interested customer lined up. That was the only thing George had left that was making any money. Maybe when you go over his accounts you can find what he wrote checks for, Alan. That isn't going to work, either. He wrote checks for cash and cashed them at the bank. Amounts ranging from 500 to 2000. Ruth frowned. He didn't seem worried about money. I've tried to talk to him a few times. He didn't seem worried about anything. He didn't seem to give a damn about anything. He almost seemed to be enjoying some big joke, on himself. And right at that moment something became very clear to me. Something I should have seen before. I wondered why I had been so dense. Once you made the proper assumption, a lot of things fell into their proper place. Chapter 10 I realized they were still talking, but I was no longer listening to what they said. Then I realized that Ruth had spoken to me. I beg your pardon? I said I have to be running along. Wait a minute. Please. Can we talk for a minute? You too, Mr. Peary. I saw that she was holding her shoulders as if she were chilled. The sun had gone under again and a raw April wind was blowing. We could sit in my car a minute. I want to make a guess as to what George was doing with the money. They looked at me oddly. Peary shrugged and said, sure. We crossed the street and got into my car, Ruth in the middle. It's just a guess. You know that Rose Fulton has never been satisfied with her husband's disappearance. Prine investigated and he's satisfied. 
George was out of town when Eloise ran off with Fulton. A neighbor saw Eloise carry a bag out to the car. Now suppose that Eloise wasn't running away permanently. Imagine that she was just going to stay the night with Fulton. She didn't want to stay at the house in case George should come home. And there were the neighbors to consider. She wouldn't want to go to a motel or hotel in the area. She was too well known. So she planned to go up to the lake with Fulton. She took just the things she'd need for overnight. Was it the time of year when there wouldn't be people up at the lake? It was this time of year, Ruth said. Now suppose George came home and found she wasn't home. He started hunting for her. And went to the lake. Or imagine that for some reason, driving back from his trip out of town, he stopped at the lake and found them there together. What would he have done? I see where this is heading, Ruth said. It gives me a strange feeling. George loved Eloise and trusted her. I guess he was the only one who couldn't see what she was. If George walked in on the two of them, I think he would have gone temporarily insane. I think he would have killed them. He used to be a powerful man, Tal. So he killed them up there at the lake. He got rid of the bodies. He could have wired weights to the bodies and sunk them in the lake, but I'm more inclined to think he buried them. Maybe he buried them on his own land there. He was lucky in that she had been seen at the inn with Fulton and she was seen leaving with Fulton. He had no way to know it would work out so well. He killed them in anger, and buried the bodies in panic. For a long time he was safe. He tried to go on as though nothing had happened. He played the part of the abandoned husband. And then somebody found the bodies. They didn't report it to the police. They went to George. Perry said eagerly, and put the bite on him. They demanded money and kept demanding money. He had to start selling things. When nearly everything was gone, he killed himself. He couldn't face exposure and trial and conviction. So we have to look for somebody who has gotten rich all of a sudden. Or somebody smart enough to just put it away and not attract attention by spending it, I said. He seemed so strange sometimes, Ruth said softly. He said queer things I didn't understand. He was like, one of those bad movies where people laugh at the wrong places. It would be quite a thing to have on your mind, Peary said. The more I think about it, the more logical it seems, Mr. Howard. I think you've hit it right on the head. The next step is to prove it. And that means looking for the bodies. I, I'd like to hear what Mrs. Fulton has to say, though. She's been annoying Prime by sending people here. I'd like to know why she's so convinced that she's willing to spend money. We could phone her, I said. If you could get her address. He got out of the car. I think I can get it. I'll be back in a minute. We placed the call from Peary's office. Peary talked to her from the inner office. Ruth and I listened on the extension, her ear close to mine. The woman had a harsh voice. How do you come into this? I don't, really. Mr. George Warden committed suicide last night. It gives us a lead to what might have happened to your husband. He was killed and he was killed down there. Maybe that woman did it. I don't know. Now I hear that man Grassman is missing. I talked to him before he went down there. When are you people going to wake up down there? What kind of a place is that, anyhow? What makes you think your husband is dead? Henry was no damn good. He'd chase anything in a skirt. I knew it. That was the way he was. He'd always come crawling back. He even liked crawling, I think. This business with that warden woman was more of the same. It wouldn't last any two years. He had $1,400 in his personal checking account. That's all tied up. He's never drawn on it. He owed payments on the car. The finance company has never been able to find the car. We've got two kids in high school. I'll say this for him, he loved the kids. He couldn't go two years without seeing them. Not Henry. Personally, believe me, I'm convinced I'll never see him again and I don't care. But he had a couple of big insurance policies. I insisted on that to protect me and the kids. What protection have I got? The companies won't pay off. It has to be six years from the time he dropped off the face of the earth. Four more years I have to get along. What about college for the kids? I tell you, you people better wake up down there and find out what happened to Henry. There was more, but she merely repeated herself. The conversation ended. I hung up and looked at Ruth. Her smile was one and she shivered a little. That was pretty convincing, Tal, she said. Very. Peary came into the outer office. He looked thoughtful. Suppose I was the blackmailer. 
I find the bodies. I came across them by accident. Or maybe I was smart enough to look for them. Okay. What do I do? I make damn well certain that nobody else finds them and spoils the game. I want to do a better job of hiding them than George did. But I don't want to completely dispose of the bodies. I want them where they can be a threat. I want them where they can be dug up. Ruth said, that man Grassman. We saw him out at the lake, Tal and I did. And now he's disappeared. That could mean that he found the bodies. And found the blackmailer, too, Peary said. I found myself remembering the odd conversation with George. When he had said he couldn't give me a job. And had offered me a gun out of stock. He had known I had come from Fitz. He had thought I was a friend of Fitz, cutting myself in on the take. It was obvious that Fitz was the blackmailer. I remembered the expensive look of the suit he was wearing when I had seen him at the inn. He had come to Hailston with the idea of finding the money Timmy had hidden. He had stayed in the cabin out at the lake. He made a point of telling me that the money wasn't hidden out at the lake. He had looked there. And found something profitable and horrible. But what was most convincing was Fitz telling me that he was certain Eloise hadn't taken the money with her. He must have appreciated his own joke. Eloise had never meant to leave permanently. She would have been a fool to leave as long as there was a chance of Timmy coming back. She knew about the money. Yet Timmy had been shrewd enough not to trust her with information about the hiding place. I thought of that first conversation that must have taken place between Fitz and George after Fitz found the bodies. What should we do? Ruth asked. Should we talk to Captain Marion? At 4.30 that grey Wednesday I stood on the lake shore with Ruth and Alan Peary, Sergeant Brubaker, and Lieutenant Prine. We were in front of the place that had belonged to George Warden before he had sold it. The narrow dock had been hauled out onto the shore for the winter and hadn't been replaced. The wind had died and the lake was like a grey steel plate. Voices had an odd resonance in the stillness. Captain Marion came out of the cabin with a husky young patrolman. The patrolman had changed to swimming trunks. He wore an aqualung with a face mask shoved up onto his forehead. He walked gingerly on the rough path in his bare feet. He looked serious, self-important, and chilled. Captain Marion said, try to stay on this line right here. The water looks kind of murky. How's the light? The patrolman clicked the watertight flashlight on. It looks bright enough. Prine said in a low voice so Captain Marion couldn't overhear. This is nonsense. No one answered him. Brew Baker moved away from us. I glanced down at Ruth's face. Her lips were compressed. She watched the patrolman wade out into the water. It shelved off abruptly. He thrashed and caught his balance, the water up to his chest. He adjusted the face mask, bit down on the mouthpiece. He glanced toward us, then moved forward and was gone, leaving a swirl of turbulence on the surface. The ripples spread out, died away. Prine lit a cigarette, threw the match aside with a quick, impatient gesture. He had looked tall when I had seen him behind his desk. Standing beside me he was not tall at all. His trunk was very long, but his legs were short and heavy. The long minutes passed. We made idle talk, but we kept our voices low. The pines on far hills looked black. The man came abruptly to the surface about forty feet offshore. He swam to the shore and waded out of the water, dripping. He pushed the face mask up onto his forehead. He was shivering. Man, it's cold down there, he said. We moved toward him. Well? Marion demanded. Here, sir. He handed Marion something. We looked at it as it lay on Marion's hand. It was the dash lighter out of an automobile, corroded and stained. I came right up from where it is. It's in about fifty feet of water, half on its side. Gray Studebaker. Illinois plates. The number is CT5851. Empty. Rock bottom. It's on a pretty steep slope. I think it can be hauled out all right. That number checks out, Prine said in a reluctant voice. Damn it, how can you figure a thing like that? Steve, Marion said, I guess maybe we goofed on this one. I guess maybe that Rose Fulton was right. Ruth had gone back to town with Peary in his car. She had seemed subdued, thoughtful. As Peary have credited me with making the guess that led to the discovery of the car, I was in Marion's good graces. I had not told them the second installment of the guess, no longer a guess, actually, that Fitzmartin was the blackmailer. The tow truck had arrived. It stood heading away from the water, 
brakes locked and wheels blocked. The taut cable stretched down into the water. At dusk they had turned on the big spotlights on the tow truck. About twenty people watched from a place just down the lake shore. Captain Marion had herded them down there out of the way. More men had come out from town. They had been searching the area, prodding into the soft earth with long steel rods. The tired patrolman surfaced again and came to shore. It ought to do it this time, he said. I got the hook around the rear axle and fastened back on the cable. He stood in the light. He had scratched his arm on a rock. There was a sheen of water diluted blood on his forearm. Try her again, Marion called. The winch began to whine again. The cable tightened visibly. I watched the drum. The cable began to come in a few feet at a time. The progress was uneven. At last, like some surfacing sea monster, the grey back of the car emerged from the water. The car was resting on its wheels. It came backward out of the water, streaming. Bright metal showed where it had been dragged against rocks. The big truck moved forward until the car was entirely on dry land. Water ran out of the car, running back into the lake. There was a smell of dampness and weed. Get yourself dried off, Ben, Marion said quietly. George, open up that back end with a pry bar. The cold, weary underwater swimmer went up to the cabin. A stocky man in uniform opened the trunk expertly. The county police who had arrived moved closer. I could hear the spectators talking excitedly to each other. The floodlights illuminated the interior of the trunk compartment brightly. There was drenched luggage in there, sodden clothing. Water was still running out of the trunk. Marion said, well, that's one place they ain't. Didn't expect them to be. Tight fit for two of them. But you can see how it was. Those shirts and socks. That stuff wouldn't jump out of the suitcase. He found them. After he killed them he just dumped their stuff in the back end, loose like. Then he aimed the car at the slope and started it up. It would be night and he wouldn't have the car lights on because that would attract attention. She got going pretty good. He knew it was deep right off here. Hitting the water probably slowed it a lot, but once on the bottom it would keep right on going down the underwater slope until it wedged in those rocks where Ben found it. I could see a woman's red plastic purse in the back end. The red had stayed bright. It looked new enough to have been carried by Eloise yesterday. Captain Marion reached in and took it out. He unsnapped it and poured the water out of it. A corroded lipstick fell to the ground. Marion grunted as he bent over and picked it up. There was a wallet in the purse. He took it out and shook the water off it, and opened it. He studied the soaked cards. Mrs. Warden's, all right. Al, can you tow the car on into town all right? Sure, Captain. Well, when you get there, spread all this stuff out in the back end of the garage where it'll get a chance to dry off. In ten minutes the car had been lashed securely and towed off. I heard the tow truck motor labor as it went up the hill toward the road. Captain, Prine said, shall I have the men keep looking? It's getting too dark to do much good. They haven't had any luck. Might as well save it until morning. Tom, can you detail some of your boys to help out in the morning? I can send a couple around. The spectators had gone, most of them. A wiry little man came over to where we stood. The swimmer, back in uniform had come down from the cabin. I could smell a strong reek of liquor on his breath. Somebody had evidently found a cold preventative for him. Prine said to the elderly little man, I told you people to stay back there. Don't you bark and show your teeth at me, boy. I want to talk to you fellows. Maybe you might learn something. Get off the... Hold it, Steve, Captain Marion said in a mild voice. What's your name? Finister. But Finister. Looking for bodies, somebody said. That's what you're doing. You could listen to me. I live off back there, other side of the road. I do chores around here. Most of the camps. Everybody knows me. Carpentry work, plumbing, masonry. Put the docks in. Take them out in the fall. I know these camps. So you know the camps. If you were hunting for bodies, Finister, where would you look? I'm getting to that. I know the camps. I know the people that come stay in them. Knew George and Timmy Warden and their pa. Knew that Eloise, too. Knew when Timmy used to come up and swim all the way across to see Ruthie Stan. Showing off, I guess. Then last year, there was a fellow named Fitzmartin up here. Guess he rented this place from George. First time it was ever rented, 
and now it's been sold, but that's beside the point. You know there's all this do-it-yourself stuff these days. Takes the bread out of a man's mouth. Takes honest work away from him. People do things their self, they botch it all up. Me, I take it like an insult. That fits Martin, he was digging around. Didn't know what he was doing. I figured whatever he was doing it was something he could hire me to do. Then by God, he trucks in cement and he knocks together some forms, and I'd be damned if he doesn't cement the garage floor. Pretty fair job for an amateur. But it was taking bread out of my mouth, so I remember it. He put that floor in last May. If I was looking for anybody's I'd look under that floor because that fits Martin, he's a mean acting man. I come around to help and he chases me clean off the place. Walks me all the way up to the road with my arm twist up behind me and calls me a trespasser. Nobody ever called me that before. Folks are friendly up here. That man he just didn't fit in at all. And I'm glad he wasn't the one who bought it. The folks who bought it, people from Reading, they seem nice. Got two little kids. I let them know when they want anything done, they get hold of Bert Finister. We stood in the glow of car lights. Captain Marion looked at Prime. Fitz Martin. Runs the lumber yard for George. Shall I go get him? We better look first, Steve. That cement floor fooled me. I went over it carefully. It hadn't been dug up and patched. It never occurred to me that the whole floor had been. I saw a pickaxe in the shed, Captain Marion said. Maybe you better swing it yourself, Steve. Maybe you need the workout. Yes, sir, said a subdued Lieutenant Prime. They parked the cars so that the headlights made the inside of the garage as bright as a stage. Prine swung and grunted and sweated until Captain Marion decided the punishment was enough. Finister came back out of the darkness with another pick and a massive crowbar. The work began to go faster. A big slab was loosened. They pried it up, heaved it over out of the way, exposing black dirt. The men worked silently. For a long time it didn't appear that they would get anywhere. I was out in the darkness having a cigarette when I heard someone say sharply, Hold it. I started toward the garage and then thought of what they might find and stopped where I was. The one called Ben came out into the night. He bent forward from the waist and gagged dryly. He stood up and coughed. Find them? I asked. They found them. Prine says it's her. He remembers the color of her hair. I rode back in with Captain Marion. Prine had gone on ahead to pick up Fitzmartin. Captain Marion felt talkative. It isn't going to be too easy with this Fitzmartin. What can we prove that will stand up? Blackmail? We'd have to have the money and George's testimony. Concealing the evidence of a crime? He can say George told him to put a cement floor in the garage. He can say he didn't have any idea what was under it. No, it isn't going to be as easy as Steve thinks it is. Sometimes Steve worries me. He gets so damn set in his mind. He isn't flexible enough. But you think it was Fitzmartin? It has to be. He milked George clean dry. George didn't have much choice, I guess. Pay up or be exposed. If he was exposed, my guess is he would have gotten life. A good defense attorney could have brought out some things about Eloise that wouldn't sound very pretty to a jury. George could have figured that when he ran out of money, Fitzmartin might, probably would, take off without saying a word. That would leave him free to walk around broke. Better than not walking around at all. What I can't figure is how Fitzmartin got it in his head to look for those bodies. He wasn't in this town when George killed the pair of them. I understand he was in prison camp with Timmy. But how would Timmy have any idea about a thing like that? There's some angles to this we won't know unless that Fitzmartin wants to talk. I could sense the way his mind was turning. He glanced at me a couple of times. You gave us some help, Howard. I grant that. But I don't feel right about the way you fit in, either. What do you mean, Captain? Aren't you just a little too damn convenient? You hit town and everything starts to pop open. Why is that? Coincidence, I guess. You knew Timmy and you know Fitzmartin. Maybe before you came here you knew Fitzmartin was milking George. Maybe that's why you came here, Howard. I didn't know anything about it. I'm not through with you, son. Don't take yourself any notion to disappear. I want you where we can talk some more. You're just too damn convenient in this whole thing. At that moment, about a mile from the Hillston city limits, a call came over the radio. Marion answered it. 
I could barely decipher Prine's Donald Duck voice over the small speaker. He's gone, Captain. Fitzmartin is gone. I've put out a description of him and his car. He was living in a shed at the rear of the lumberyard. All his personal stuff is gone. I felt the space heater. There was a little warmth left. He didn't leave too long ago. How about roadblocks? Damn it, Steve. I've told you before. Roadblocks aren't worth a damn around here. There's too many roads. There just aren't enough men and vehicles in this area to close all those roads. That stove could have been turned off three hours ago. You'd have to have your blocks set up right now this minute on every road within a hundred miles at least. What do you suggest, sir? Prine said more humbly. Wait and see if somebody picks him up. Marion broke the connection. Okay, Howard. You seem to know Fitzmartin pretty well. Where does he come from? Originally from Texas, I think. What's his line of work? I think he worked in oil fields. Ever say anything about his relatives? He never talked very much. That's not much help, I guess. Where can we drop you off? My car's parked across the street from Peary's office. Want to tell you that I appreciate you making a pretty good guess about this whole thing, Howard. I can't help telling you I wonder just how much of it was guessing. And I wonder why you came here. I'd like it if you'd play the cards face up. I had thought him amiable, mild, ineffectual. Hour by hour I had revised my opinion. I had thought Prine was the dangerous one. Prine was the fool. Captain Marion was something else entirely. I'm not hiding anything, Captain. We've got George dead, and that grassman missing, and we've got those two bodies, and now Fitzmartin on the run. It has to get tied together a little better before I feel right about it. I'm sorry I can't help you. I'm sorry you won't help, son. Good night. They drove away. It was after ten and I was famished. In twelve hours I would be picking Antoinette up. With luck, in twenty-four hours I would be gone. Either with her or alone. I didn't know which it would be. Call it a form of monomania. I had thought about the money for too long. I had aimed toward it for too long. Tomorrow I would have it. Once I had it, maybe I could begin to think clearly again. I found a place to eat. I was just finishing when Brubaker came in. He sat beside me at the counter and gloomily flipped the menu open. A hell of a long day, he said. It has been. And not over yet. At least they're giving me time to eat. And then back on the job. Until God knows when. Nobody will get any sleep tonight. I thought Captain Marion said he'd just wait and hope Fitzmartin gets picked up. That's right. I mean about the girl. I suddenly felt very cold. What girl? Thank you for listening to today's story. I really hoped you enjoyed it as much as I did. There will be more to come. Please subscribe not to miss out on what is next. I will be looking forward to your return. The music is by Madfan from Pixabay. To support this and other artists go to Pixabay.